with the Lord's help. Loving Heavenly Father, our gracious and merciful Father, we thank Thee for this new day, the first day of the week that has graciously granted unto us, when from the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the same, Thy name will be highly exalted, worshipped, and it will be glorified through songs and through scriptures and the heartfelt worship and also through sacrifices. We pray, dear Lord, as we join that big number, a multitude, uncountable, along with the heavenly host, our hearts may be filled. We thank thee for the personal experiences of many of thy saints who have written their say, experience and also their understanding of you in these beautiful songs we are singing. May we also come to some such a personal understanding and revelation about our Lord in our personal lives. Lord, that's our humble prayer. We may worship you in spirit and in truth. So guide our utterance and bless our meditation together. Prepare us for worship and the day before us. We bring ourselves under your blood and offer this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Many a times when we sing these beautiful songs, it uh, touches my heart very deeply to think about it. How many saints of God, those who really love him, how can they understand their Lord in such a way and pen down these beautiful words? Many a times we can't express what we are feeling inside. So as we carry on in our Christian life, may we also come to such personal understanding of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The text for this morning is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15, Paul uses a very wonderful, unique word. He says, thanks be unto God for the unspeakable gift. 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. This gift of God is unspeakable. That means we cannot describe or we cannot comprehend, or we cannot understand exactly in all its perfectness, perfection who is our Lord Jesus Christ. See what John says about this. The book of John chapter 21 and the last verse 25. John's gospel chapter 21 and verse 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written everyone, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. He says, the works of Lord Jesus Christ are so numerous that if you begin to write all his works, even the whole world will not be able to contain the books which will be written about him. It's only about the works. What about the words he has spoken? Words of life and spirit. In John chapter 6 and verse 63, he, the Lord Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are life and spirit. Suppose if man begins to write about his words and the works, what the Lord Jesus has done, I don't think so. There will be place for any other book in the whole world, in any library, in any bookstore. It will be filled with the books only about our Lord Jesus Christ. So so marvelous he is and so uh, uh, unsearchable he is and so unspeakable he is. Beloved. How to understand this? In a very, very simple way. I'll just give you an example and then we'll go ahead. A father wanted to know what is in the mind of his only daughter whom he loved very much. And then one day he was a Christian father. He used to raise her up in a Christian teaching with the Bible. She used to go to church and all these things as we children have the privilege in our own homes and churches. One day the father had an idea. He, to, he thought, I will give a choice to my daughter and I will give a choice to choose a gift. And uh, through the choice, I will find out what exactly is in her heart and how she is going to prosper in her future life. Mind you, she's a little girl, about 10 years old. So the father, he brought one pen and he brought one coin. If the daughter chooses a pen, she wants to have wisdom. That's what his understanding was. And if the daughter chooses a coin, she is going to love the wealth of the world. Now, he called his only daughter with great love. He said, dear one, I want to give you a gift today, but I will, you have to choose your own gift. So he said, 
She was standing at some distance from him and he said, I'm holding these two things in front of you, a pen and a coin. Whichever gift you want, you come and choose it. The girl saw both the gifts, the pen and the coin. She started to walk towards the father. As she was approaching, the, her, the father's heart was thumping. It was pounding, actually. And he was wondering, what is she going to choose? What is she going to choose? Will she choose wisdom or will she choose the wealth of this world? But as she came near to him, she brushed aside both the things from his hand. She brushed it aside and both the pen and the coin, they fell on the ground and she fell upon him, hugged him and then she, um, she tightly held him and said, Daddy, I want you. The father could not believe. The father had tears in his eyes. And after some time, when he composed himself, then he really brushed away his tears and then he made her to sit upon his lap and said, little one, what made, do you really love me so much? What made you to choose me? I was not the choice for you. Then she said, daddy, in fact, I wanted to have the pen and I wanted to have the coin, both. But you asked me to choose only one gift. And I did not know what. Then a thought came to me. The pen belongs to my father and the coin also belongs to my father. If I choose my father, my father will give me everything. What a revelation, dear ones. If we choose this unspeakable gift, the very person of Lord Jesus Christ, about whom man can never write sufficiently, Man cannot comprehend sufficiently. Who is this? We have been singing that. Who is he? Who is he? Who is he? Do you think that these 10 verses or 10 lines of the song, what we have sung, has described him sufficiently? So this is a wonderful truth. When we accept and receive the wonderful unspeakable, incomprehensible, unsearchable gift of the person of Lord Jesus Christ given by God. We have everything. We don't need anything other than that. Gift is given because of love and because we want to honor. You see, that's the only reason we give gifts. Suppose if we love somebody, we give a gift. Or if we want to honor somebody, we give him a gift. Please open with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 43 and verse 4. We have read this many a times. The book of Isaiah, chapter 43 and verse 4. Since thou was precious in my sight, thou has been honorable. I have loved thee. God, Jehovah, the holy, holy, holy God, dwelling in a light where no man can approach the almighty God, the creator of the whole world. He says, I have found you to be very precious in my sight. The Lord, when he looked upon me, he thought that I was very precious to him. Therefore, he made me honorable. And therefore, he loved me. Understand this. He loved me because I was honorable and very precious. Not to make me precious, not to make me honorable. Because I was already precious and honorable, therefore he loved me. Oh, how can we understand? What can we write about this truth? I have never understood this, but I accept it and it humbles me very much. Lord, what preciousness did you see in me? Or what is that honorable thing which you have seen in me that you should love me so much? So this unspeakable gift is given out of love and out of honor for a precious person like you and me. And I believe, beloved, when we look into our Lord, only one small aspect, only one small aspect, that infinite grandeur of that person, Lord Jesus Christ, whom we cannot understand, incomprehensible. His love without dimensions. His grace abounding. His mercy above the heavens. His faithfulness forever. What can we say about him? 
So today we are going to look into our Lord, this unspeakable gift, only as a shepherd. Uh, just a couple of thoughts, just to inspire the, our worship in spirit and in truth. Psalmist understood this God Jehovah as his shepherd when he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Unspeakable gift. And as I told you, if you accept this gift, you will not need anything because along with this comes everything. See that little girl? She could have chosen a pen or a coin. The father gave her a choice, but she brushed aside everything. I don't want anything. I want you, daddy, because everything belongs to you. And if I choose you, because I love you, because I choose you, you give me everything. What did God do to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ? John's Gospel, chapter 3 and verse 35. The father loved the son and had given all things in his hand. Believe this. Luke's Gospel in chapter 15. When the eldest son of the prodigal came back home, what is the father saying to him? John, Luke's Gospel, chapter 15 and verse 31. Son, thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine. What a truth is this? In the person of Lord Jesus Christ, that unspeakable gift, God has bestowed and emptied heaven in order to bless us with his blessings. He that spared not his son, but delivered him for us all, shall he not along with him give us freely all other things? Have you received that wonderful God, gift of God's love? Have you received that gift of God's uh, grace? Then we can worship him in spirit, spirit and in truth. We don't need anything. Today, we are going to look into him in this very beautiful aspect. He is the shepherd of our soul. We don't need anything. What is the price he has paid in order to make me as his own sheep? Why did I accept him as my shepherd? Two things we are going to see. The price he has paid and why did he pay? Please open with me, Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, and the verse is uh, uh, 4. Luke chapter 15 and verse 4. What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? This is the truth. The price he paid is 99 for one. Nobody can understand this. Some things seems to be illogical. It is beyond human natural perception. If you think about a shepherd that he has left 99 of his sheep in the wilderness where it is frequently haunted by the wolves and the wild animals in search of one little sheep, you will say, this shepherd is out of his mind. He's not in his right mind. But that's the price the Lord Jesus Christ has paid, 99 for one. And if you want to understand in all its truth and in the spirit, please open with me the book of Revelation, chapter 5 and verse 12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Do you know this is the price which the Lord Jesus Christ has paid for the redemption of our soul in order to give us that wonderful gift of great salvation, free salvation, full salvation, eternal salvation. He gave his power. He gave his riches. He gave his wisdom. He gave his strength. He gave his honor. He gave his glory. He gave his blessing. All these things we read in the Gospels and in the letters. He was crucified. He was crucified in weakness. That is the strength he gave in order to redeem him. He gave all his power. He has the power to judge. He has the power to condemn. He has the power to kill. He has the power to cast us into the lake of fire. But no, he never used any of his power. He used all his power. Luke 5.24, he, he only for the forgiveness of our sin. Let the whole world know that I have the power to forgive your sin. Lord Jesus Christ used all his almighty power only to forgive my sins. 
Then his riches also he gave. You know our Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, he became poor. That through his poverty, we might become rich. All the riches of his grace and mercy and wisdom and glory. He has poured it upon you. He became a poor, poor man. He gave his wisdom. It needed the wisdom of God in order to bring me to salvation. He gave his honor. He was despised. He was rejected. And he was, uh, he was, uh, uh, he was, uh, what do you call, split upon. He lost everything, his respect, his honor. Even as an ordinary human being, he was not treated on the cross. He emptied himself of his glory. Just I want to say, the man who is the blessing himself, he has become a curse for us by hanging on the tree. That is the price the Lord Jesus Christ prayed in order to redeem my soul. His power, his riches, his wisdom, his strength, his honor, his glory, and his blessings. Everything he paid it on the cross. 99 for one. And secondly, why did he pay such a price? Why did he pay such a price? In the book of Hebrews and chapter 11 and verse 40, when we look into the big list of the heroes of faith. We can call them of the household of faith. How does that chapter end? The book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 40. He says, God having provided some better thing for us. That they without us should not be made perfect. That means the household of faith is not perfected without you and without me. Without that one sheep, that 99, that number is not complete. It doesn't become 100 out of 100. Do you understand this? When we even think about it, it puts us to shame. And we are very much humbled in our, oh Lord, oh Lord, is it because of me? That one wavered, wild sinner, that the household of faith is brought into perfection. That's the reason you paid such a price for me on the cross. That's the reason you emptied yourself of everything on the cross. Am I so precious in your sight? Am I so honorable in your sight? Am I so loved in your sight that you should pay such a price for me? Do you know, beloved? It is because of you, whoever you are. Think about it. That must fill your heart with joy and that must bring humbleness in your spirit. Oh Lord, Hebrews 11.40 says, the household of faith was not perfected without me and therefore you came searching for me. I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. I'll tell you an example. Our father had a great uh, hobby of solving puzzles. What puzzles? Suppose if I want to prepare a picture, there will be 100 pieces. So all the pieces will be jumbled. And then in a box, I will keep on picking one one piece and fixing it at the right spot. And when all the 100 pieces have been fixed in the right spot, the picture is complete and thereby is revealed the glory of the beautiful picture. When all the Pieces have been put in the right place. This is a true testimony. I heard it from a young man from the United States. Then he said, my father, when he came back from the office one day, this is how he used to unwind himself. This is how to, he used to relax, sit down with a cup of coffee. The mother will be preparing something and he will spend about one hour, one and a half or sometimes two hours also in order to solve the puzzle. And the moment he finished this, finishes that puzzle, he feels relaxed and he feels really strengthened and refreshed. One day, this little boy wanted to play a naughty game on his father. So quietly he went, picked up one piece from there and he put it in his pocket. The father, after laboring for two hours, he finished the pictures and finished the, fixing the pieces and that one piece was missing. He was troubled. The box is empty. He's uh, uh, looking under the table. There is no piece. He's going to the drawer. There's no piece. He's looking at the, uh, on top of the table. Where is it? He's going to his wife. He's uh, calling her loudly. Where? What? Who has touched my box? He's calling the boy. He was so uh, upset and he was so annoyed. He was not, he lost all his peace. He lost his rest. And when the little boy saw that the father was so 
poor man, a father whom he loved. He was just playing, trying to play a naughty game, uh, game on him. He, when he saw that his father became so peaceless and rested, so very uh, annoyed and so very terrible, quietly went and put that piece on the top of the, the book. After searching for some time, the father found that piece. The boy says, my father took that piece in his hand. He was jumping like a small child. He was jumping with joy like a small child and is loudly shouting, it is finished, it is finished, it is finished. Do you know, beloved? When the shepherd came searching and he found that one little sheep, he took that sheep in his arms. He took that sheep in his arms tenderly and lovingly and with a great joy, he shouted this, it is finished. This Lord is my shepherd. This unspeakable gift is my shepherd. I shall not want anything. What a price he paid for me. How precious I am in his sight. How to understand this. Look at the cross. He poured out everything. His power, his riches, his glory, his honor, everything. And then he told me, my dear little child, you are the one who brought perfection into the household of my faith. Therefore, you are so precious to me. John's Gospel, chapter 10 and verse 9. John's Gospel, chapter 10 and verse 9. He says, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. He is my savior. Secondly, he shall go in and out. They, he is my security. He shall find pasture. He is my sustenance. What do I lack, beloved? He has saved my soul. He sustains my life in this world. And he also secures me. He has secured me for eternity. Everlasting life he has given to me. What shall I say? Oh Lord, you are my savior. You are my sustainer. You are my security. You are my all in all. Lord, I choose you. If there is anybody who has joined us for this worship this morning, when others are pouring out their hearts in grateful worship to the Lord in spirit and in truth, and if you are the one who was left behind, Lord Jesus is still seeking you. Come to him. Come to him. He loves you. You are very precious to him. You are honorable inside, in his sight. Consider the price he has paid for you. Let us then bow down and worship such a shepherd who has become an unspeakable gift of God's love and God's grace to every one of us. I hand it over back to Brother John Albert. Yes, but thank God for the God's word, loving and living word. Now we will go separately, individually, for our individual worship. After some time, we will come back 10 minutes later and we start with a song for the second part of the worship service. Our loving Heavenly Father, our gracious and merciful Father, we thank Thee that has gathered us in the one spirit to look at You and to understand You and to realize what an unspeakable gift of love and grace Thou has given to us. In Lord Jesus Christ, not only we are complete, but because of each one of us, the body of Christ is complete. Lord, may thy Holy Spirit make us to comprehend this truth. And if we are able to realize this, Lord, we will be ever, ever humble. We will not need anything. What a price you pay to give us this great salvation. The art of our sustenance and the art of our security for both now and forever. Lord, we fall at your feet and worship you. As we dwell upon your precious word for a little time, you may speak to us in the context of the present difficult days we are going through. 
anoint us from above, give us thy divine utterance, the clarity of thoughts and the continuity of expressions, everything may be granted from above. Cover us under your blood. We bind all the powers of darkness in thy holy name and offer this prayer with great expectation in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, the song we sang, in him I'm complete. But we want to go one step ahead and think about it. And unless the Lord makes us to understand and realize it is very, very difficult. Not only am I complete in him, but the body of Christ is complete because of me. See? I was that one missing piece of puzzle for which he has come down to this world. 99 for one. It really humbles me. I still want to understand the depth of this love and the depth of this grace. For our devotion before we take part in the Lord's table, just want to remind you the present context and the difficult days we are going through points only to one truth, the coming of our Lord. It's very imminent. There were days and there were some years passed by when those who spoke about the second coming of the Lord Jesus and resurrection and all these things, we thought, oh, how wise they are and how knowledgeable they are. In fact, beloved, in our fellowship, or in other places also, those who spoke about the uh, second coming, they were considered to be very prominent and uh, uh, very popular preachers. But today, every young man and woman, every young and old, their thoughts are focused upon only upon one thing, because of the times we are passing through, because of the difficult days we are passing through. Is the Lord coming soon? Is the Lord coming soon? So many phone calls. So many people they keep on asking. So in the context of the present times, we are passing through uncertain days, fearful days, difficult days. And also the thought, the imminent coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, let us turn again once to the Holy Bible and try to learn a few things. How can we be prepared for the coming of the Lord? In the Old Testament, through the life of Jacob, we find a very wonderful principle. The book of Genesis and chapter 48 and verse 2. The book of Genesis chapter 48 and verse 2 says, And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee, and Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. I will uh, speak this uh, verse in just one sentence. Behold, Joseph cometh and Israel strengthened himself to wait for him. That's the principle. If I want to be ready for the Lord's coming, if I want to be accounted worthy to stand before the Son of Man, and if I want to be a partaker of the first and holy resurrection, this is the principle which should guide me. Behold, Joseph cometh Israel strengthened himself and waited for him. Behold, I come quickly. So said the Lord Jesus Christ. What should we do? We should strengthen ourselves and say, Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. We are going to look into four examples how we can strengthen ourselves. I don't know whether we will be able to finish them or not, but we will start and see for the next 40 minutes how the Lord is going to help us and how he is going to lead us. The four, four examples, how to strengthen ourselves. Because the principle is, never forget it, write it somewhere. Behold, Joseph cometh, Israel strengthened himself and waited. The Lord Jesus said, behold, I come quickly. We should strengthen ourselves and say, amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The first example is Daniel. The second example is Joseph. The third example is Esther. The fourth example is Nehemiah. How these people, they strengthen themselves and how they are uh, able to uh, speak to you and me today. Daniel, 
how did he strengthen himself in the book of daniel in chapter 1 we read in verse 8 the book of daniel chapter 1 and verse 8 says but daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself very beautiful verse again i will reduce this verse into one small fragment daniel preferred a character more than a career you must ponder upon these things if you are really desirous of taking part in the first resurrection if you really have that longing to meet the lord in the mid air if you want to be found worthy accounted worthy to stand before the son of man you must ponder upon these truths this these are the ways in which you can strengthen yourself the principle behold joseph cometh israel strengthened himself and waited behold i come quickly said the lord jesus christ and we should strengthen ourselves and be able to say amen even so come lord jesus now the first example is daniel when we read daniel chapter 1 and verse 8 we come to understand that daniel preferred a character more than a career now look at this daniel is a teenager many servants of god have told us that he was about 15 to 16 years old when he entered into the land of babylon so daniel is a teenager he is small in age and also he is in captivity he is uh, separated from his family from his uh, country and from his father's house and everything he is in a strange country but there in captivity in a strange foreign land though he is a small boy teenager he has been selected to be a part of the civil services in babylon what an honor this is in our country civil services upsc for is and other things is considered to be the toughest examination and students they call it an achievement people may have a desire for engineering and this thing and that thing so many things but in our country the toughest examination is the upsc civil services which is considered to be an achievement but imagine a small teenager in a foreign country in captivity he has been selected to be a part of the civil services so that he can be running the affairs in a foreign country what an honor this was the time for daniel to say now i will show them who i am now i will huh, in competition with the heathen people in competition with those who are in their own land he said now i have got a chance i will try to prove myself i will show myself who am i but no Daniel was not carried away he preferred a character more than a career why because he was a lover of the god he was a lover of the word of god he used to love his god jehovah and he knew the scriptures very well that this is the food he should not eat and therefore very humbly he went to the man who was in charge and said please please i don't want to have this food then that man said no 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 you are going to endanger my life in front of the king because this is the food which was ordered by the king and therefore what did he do he went to another person and he requested him why the thought in the heart of daniel was so strong that if i follow my career i'm going to stand before a king for the next 30 40 50 years of my life but if i develop a character divine character according to the scriptures i am going to stand before the king of kings luke's gospel chapter 21 and verse luke's gospel chapter 21 and the verse is uh, i will read 
Watch ye therefore and pray always. That's what uh, Daniel is doing. That you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things, the temptations and the lures and the, all these things which will come upon you and to stand before the Son of Man. Now I'll tell you, beloved, once again, he who prefers a career, he will stand before king. But he who prefers a character more than his career, he is going to stand before the king of kings forever and ever. Look at Daniel. He was not carried away. Now I will explain. The Lord must explain to us by the uh, opening of the scriptures what is the meaning of preferring a character more than a career. Let us come to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. In these days, the last age of the world. This is the Final age of the world, you can call it the grace of age, uh, age of grace, you can call it the age of the church, whatever it be, we are in a Laodicean church age. The Laodicean believers, this is what uh, recorded about them, the testimony with the glorified Lord Jesus Christ walking among the candlesticks, he gives a testimony about the Laodicean believers. The book of Revelation, chapter 3 and verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. What a record about the Laodicean believer. He is thinking, Lord is saying, you are thinking you are very rich and you don't need anything. But where is the Lord Jesus? In verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Your affluence and your prosperity and the increase of earthly goods have crowded out the Lord Jesus Christ from your home and from your heart and even in from the church and is standing outside. And yet you say, I have need of nothing. Following the careers of our life, following earthly prosperity and the increase in goods, not knowing the Lord Jesus Christ has already spoken to us in the book of Luke in chapter 15 and verse 12. The life of a man does not contain in the goods what he possesses. It's not in our money. It's not in our prosperity. It is not in our achievements of this world. That is not. Sometimes, beloved, these days, believers, we have so much are fascinated by the things of the world, by the comforts of the world, and by the earthly prosperity that our affluence, we have achieved it. We have pursued a career, we have achieved everything, but our affluence, our prosperity, everything has crowded out, has pushed out the Lord Jesus Christ from our hearts, from our homes, and even from the churches. Tender, very polite, very humble. The Lord Jesus Christ is standing outside the door, knocking at the door and saying, my dear son, my dear daughter, I still love you. Come to me. What will I do? Here we read in verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. From where he is saying, he is uh, he's, uh, offering this from standing outside the door. Lord Jesus Christ is standing outside the door because my prosperity, my affluence has crowded him out. I don't need anything. In the morning we heard, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What uh, unspeakable gift we have received, both now and forevermore. What peace, what joy, what rest and what comfort and what assurance, what hope it brings to me. He's not only my shepherd, he's my savior, he's my friend, he's my father, he's my mother, he's all and in all for me. He's my Lord, he's my king, he's my guide, he's my teacher. What is he not to me, both for my inward life and also for my outward life? But no, we prefer. A career more than a character. And therefore, the Lord is saying, my dear son, had you given me a place in your heart and home, I would have given you gold tried in the fire. That is the meaning of divine character. Gold tried in the fire. Gold tried in the fire. Purity of divine agape character, which is called love. Now, this is one characteristic 
spoken by the our lord jesus christ about the levodician believer we have to be very very careful because we are living in this age the age of the levodician church and we are among the levodician believers is this testimony about you and me now come to uh, uh, compare this with the father of the faithful abraham he is the father of the faithful all those who believe on the lord jesus christ they are the children of abraham so says paul in the book of romans in chapter 4 all those who believe on the lord jesus christ they are the children of abraham as children of abraham let us look at our father what did he do in the book of genesis and chapter 22 the book of genesis and chapter 22 and verse 2 god jehovah called him one day and this is how he wanted to test him. Am I worthy that I should go through this fiery test? Am I worthy that the Lord will pick me out for this fiery test? Abraham is going through fire. Now you see, verse 2. And God Jehovah said to Abraham, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Get thee into the land of Moriah. Offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I shall show thee of. God is saying, Abraham, I know that you love your son. What did Abraham say? Yes, Lord, I love my son. There is no doubt about it because I got it as a promise from you. And this is a wonderful gift you gave to me. Isaac was a wonderful gift given by God. And who is God? He's the giver. But now the giver is asking the gift. And the Lord is saying, yes, you love the gift. There's no doubt. Abraham says, yes, Lord, I love the gift what you have given to me. But I'm telling you, you give that gift to me as a burnt offering. What did Abraham do? Early in the morning, he got up. He took everything along with his son Isaac. And he was walking towards Mount Moriah. Three days and three nights. He saw that place of our off. He walked all the way night and day. Reached that place. Built an altar. Bound his son. Laid him upon the altar. And there, when he lifted up the knife, Abraham is speaking from the bottom of his eye, his spirit is speaking. What does he say? You know, oh God, you said, I love Isaac. Yes, I love Isaac. He is the gift I received from you. But today on Mount Moriah, I want to tell you by laying down that gift upon the altar, I love the giver more than the gift. God so loved the world that he gave his son. That is divine nature. That is the divine character. And that is something which was tested through the fire. The love of God, the love of Jesus Christ, even the fire which was burning on the cross, the fire of God's judgment could not drown his love. My dear son, your affluence, your prosperity, and the gifts I gave you, everything has crowded me out. I'm standing behind the door. You're saying, you're thinking within yourself, I need nothing. I want to tell you, you don't have that gold tried in the fire. Where is your love for me? You are loving the gifts more than the giver. Look at your father, Abraham. He loved the giver more than the gift. What are we going to say this morning? How are we going to be strengthened? strengthened by the love of God which has filled our hearts. Let that Holy Spirit of God fill our hearts with such love that nothing of this world, even gold and silver and honor and respect, whatever may be the achievement, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is asking that question in the book of Romans and chapter 8. The book of Romans, chapter 8. And he says in verse 34, uh, so, so verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? How easily, beloved, the perishable riches of this world and the temporary prosperity of this world and the fleeting praise of man. We are fascinated by those things. We pursue those things. It may be by God's grace, we are even achieving those things, but our affluence and prosperity has moved out the Lord from our heart and homes and the church. David preferred a character more than a career. If you ask Daniel, sorry, Daniel, Daniel, don't you love your career? He said, yes, I love it. 
It's an honor God has given to me. Not that dishonoring. Oh, I don't want to have this. I don't want to have this. I'm in a foreign country. I want to live for the Lord. I want to do like this. No, no, no. All those things are, they are the false sentiments. You must love your children. You must enjoy your children. You must have a job. You must rejoice in your labor. You must do everything. But when it comes to building of an altar, you must be able to say, Oh Lord, I love the giver more than the gift. I'm willing to lay down everything for you and for your glory. Sometimes it hurts me very much, beloved, when the Lord looks into my heart, if this is what he's thinking and saying about me, John's gospel and chapter five, verse 42, John's gospel, chapter five and verse 42, but I know you, that you have not the love of God in your heart. We have everything, but we don't have that character. The character gold tried in the fire. The character, that means divine nature, which is agape love, divine love filling our hearts. Romans chapter five and verse five. The book of Romans chapter five and verse five. May I read that verse for you, please? He says, hope make it not a shame. It, it, it begins from verse 3. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Sometimes fiery tribulations. Tribulation worketh patience. Patience experience. Experience hope. Hope make it not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us through tribulations through the fiery trials in our heart. Love of God is poured into our hearts. We are so much settled in our comfort zones. We rarely want to be disturbed. We don't want to be disturbed, but the Lord wants to shake us. So that is the first way how we can strengthen ourselves. It is the love of God, which is filling our hearts, which strengthens us so much that we can say, like Abraham, Lord, I love the giver, God Jehovah, more than my gift. You gave it a gift to me. I enjoyed it. You're asking, I'm readily giving it to you. Daniel preferred a character more than a career. Be willing to sacrifice our time, our talents, our treasure, so that even through tribulations, even through sacrifices, Nobody will be able to separate us from the love of Christ, from the love of God, and our hearts will be filled with his love. And especially in these last days, when we are so, so fascinated by the perishable goods of this world. May the Lord help us to understand. Strengthened by the love of God, love for the giver more than the gift. Secondly, we look into the example of Joseph. We read about Joseph in the book of Genesis and chapter 39 and verse 9. The book of Genesis chapter 39 and verse 9. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now, the second way how we can strengthen ourselves is Joseph preferred purity more than pleasure. I'll repeat this once again and again and again. Joseph preferred purity more than pleasures. You know, beloved, the pleasures of sin are only momentary for a season. The book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 25 choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You see, the pleasures of sin only for a season, but the pain is everlasting. It wounds you. It destroys you. It completely, it completely, eh, what do you call, it completely removes you away from the presence of God. 
So Joseph preferred purity more than pleasures. And now I just want to understand this very clearly. If the pleasures of sin are only seasonal, are momentary, and if I'm not supposed to enjoy those pleasures, is my life going to be only a life of sorrow and gloom and morose and all very quiet? Is there no joy for a Christian? Is there no joy for a Christian? Young brother, young sister, if you have decided to keep your body as the temple of the Holy Ghost, if you have decided to keep yourself pure because you want to meet the Lord in the midair and be a partaker of the first resurrection, are you continuously going to be only sorrowful? When see, look at, looking at the other friends who are enjoying all the pleasures of this present world, no, there is a great, great blessing for those who have preferred purity more than pleasures. Please open with me to the book of Psalm 45 and verse 7. The book of Psalm 45 and verse 7. The, this is written about the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a messianic psalm. And in that messianic psalm, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what is mentioned about purity and holiness to understand in this part of the world. We are not talking about sinlessness because that is not possible. But this is the true meaning of purity as we are still continuing in the old flesh. The book of Psalm 45 and verse 7. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, mark that word. Therefore, therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Therefore, God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness more than thy fellows. Why did God anoint you? Wherefore are you anointed? Because you hate wickedness and love righteousness. With what are you anointed? You are anointed with the oil of gladness. How many times we have prayed, Oh Lord, anoint me for the preaching. Anoint me for the singing. Anoint me for playing of the music. When we go even to preach the gospel on the streets, beloved, many a times I have prayed, Lord, keep all of us under the anointing as we go to share the glorious gospel with many of those who are disturbed, we are, are being perishing in this world. So we need anointing for everything. Every work of the Lord, we need anointing for preaching and for teaching and for Sunday school ministry, for youth ministry, for sisters ministry, even for singing and for music and for preaching, everything. We need an anointing. But tell me honestly, don't tell me. Tell it in the presence of the Lord. Have you ever prayed? Have I ever prayed for this anointing? Oh God, oh God Jehovah, oh almighty God, I want to be anointed with the oil of gladness. Anoint me with your joy. Anoint me with gladness in my heart. What is this gladness? The book of Psalm and 4 and verse 2. The book of Psalm 4 and verse 2. What does the psalmist say? Psalm 4 and uh, verse, uh, I'm sorry, verse 7. Psalm 4 and verse 7. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and wine increase. There are some people who are very glad when their corn, when their wine increases because of their job and because of their money and because of their friendships, because of their links, what they have. Or you can say, because even of the pleasures, what they enjoy in this present world, the gadgets, what they hold. Oh, beloved, unlimited resources of entertaining yourself in this present world. Unlimited resources. But the psalmist is saying, those are glad because of their increase of wine and oil. They all are rejoicing in the perishable things of this world. But my, my condition is, you have put gladness in my heart more than in the time when their corn and wine increase. They are rejoicing. They are having joy in the pleasures of this world. I have relinquished them. I don't need them. I want to be saved from them. I want to be protected from the temporary pleasures of this world. Whatever it may be. Mobiles, gadgets, friendships, pleasures, entertainment. It's become so rampant these days. And it has become so easy these days. But you have anointed me with something else. 
you have put gladness into my heart more than things my dear young brother and sister young and even older people i want to tell you when you look at the world even maybe some carnal believers in the church they are really enjoying their life they are having the time of their life when the time of their life will come they are thinking oh we are having the time of our life in these pleasures but i want to tell you when the time of your life comes to an end then you will repent nobody to help you he had that had this hope that i am going to see my lord i am going to be with him forever and ever will purify himself even as he is pure 1 john chapter 3 and verse 3 as joseph preferred a purity more than pleasures in the bible it is said in the book of james chapter 4 and verse 7 resist the devil and he will flee from you but sometimes after resisting also the devil doesn't flee from you then what you should do second timothy chapter 2 and verse 22 flee all these things you flee away from them when you resist the devil will flee and if the doesn't 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 flee you flee away from them the joseph did exactly the same thing as long as he could he resisted but the time came in his life and the day when he could no more resist he left his garment he fled away from her we know this story very well and for pursuing purity listen carefully please the next portion of this message for pursuing purity for preferring purity more than the temporary pleasures which were falling upon him how could he resist he was accused he was condemned he was put into jail what shame what sorrow what reproach is this do you know what does the holy scriptures tell about the sufferings of joseph Joseph himself says in the book of Genesis chapter 42 and after sorry in chapter 40 and verse 14 and 15 but after telling them the uh, interpretation of their dreams in the prison house what does Joseph say about himself think upon me when it shall well be well with thee show kindness i pray thee unto me and make mention of me and to pharaoh bring me out of this prison house indeed i was stolen away out of the land of hebrews and here also have i done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon what does the psalmist say Uh, so cool and so composed we hear the words of joseph see i have not done anything wrong here even there i did not do anything wrong they sold me and they sold me into slavery and here also i was so faithful i was so pure but still they have accused me of adultery a uh, something beloved which, which is unthinkable do you know adultery in the holy bible is called a wound which is incurable a sin for which there is no ransom it is a horrible pit into which once if you fall only those who are hated by god will fall into this pit it's a very very terrible accusation it's not so severe like murder it's not so severe like thieving it's not so severe like telling lies but an adult what reproach that is and what does the prophet amos say the book of amos chapter 6 and verse 6 i just want to uh, make you understand the severity of the test and the tribulation what joseph was going through but look at his uh, present demeanor the book of amos chapter 6 and verse 6 amos chapter 6 and verse 6 they drink in wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments that means they are having all the temporary pleasures you read verse 4 and 5 and 6 and everything after describing about the pleasures of their life what they are enjoying in verse 6 and the last line he says they are not grieved for the affliction of joseph joseph was in affliction 
And what are the others doing? Verse four onwards, I will read. Um, Amos chapter six, verses four, five, and six. Lie upon the beds of ivory, stretch themselves upon their couches, eat the lambs of the flock, cows out of the midst of the stall, that chant to the sound of wine, invent to themselves instruments like music, and drink wine in bowls, anoint themselves with the chief ointments, but they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. There is a group which is enjoying the pleasures, but they don't know the afflictions of Joseph. And what does the psalmist say? The book of Psalm 100 and the book of Psalm 105 and verse 18, whose Psalm 105 and verse 18, whose feet they hurt with fetters, he was laid in iron. Living Bible translation says, and iron entered into his soul. Look at the sorrow and the reproach and the affliction and the tribulation and the shame through which Joseph is going through. He was going through affliction. Other people are drinking wine and enjoying music and they are uh, sleeping on beds and couches of ivory and so many things are there. And an iron entered into his soul. Such a man, if there was a man in the whole nation of Israel, Egypt, to be sorrowful and to be weeping and to be downcast, it will be Joseph. Nobody, no man has uh, the, the liberty or nobody must be so sorrowful as Joseph. But what do we see in Joseph? The book of Genesis and chapter 40, verse 7. Verse 6 and 7, and Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them and behold, they were sad. Joseph is in prison. I told you he's going through affliction and I entered into his soul. Others were enjoying what a shame, what a reproach and what a terrible thing is going through. But he came in the present to the other two persons, the chief of the butlers and the chief of the bakers. And he looked at them and they were behold, they were very sad. And in verse 7, he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house saying, wherefore look ye so sadly today? My, what a question is this? Joseph, the man who should have been the most sad and sorrowful man in the whole country and the nation of Egypt, he is asking the other people, why are you looking so sad today? The reason is, you know, this Joseph, he pursued purity more than pleasures. Therefore, God anointed him with the oil of gladness. Young man, young woman, dear brother and sister, in spite of the rampant provisions the world has made for your temporary pleasures of this world, if you relinquish them, if you want to keep your body as the temple of the Holy Ghost, if you want to be prepared for the resurrection in the bidder, I want to tell you, you will never be sorrowful. Let them enjoy. Let them enjoy. You will be anointed with the oil of gladness. Always. Even if you are going through tribulation. Even if you are going through uh, difficulties. Even if you are going through fearful times. Even if you are going through tribulation and afflictions. You will be joyful. You have put gladness into my heart more than at a time when they were enjoying their corn and wine and pleasures and everything. What an example. Come, let us cleanse ourselves from every sin, easily besetting sins, which makes us so impure. I'm talking not only about the sins of the flesh, I'm also worried more about the sins of the spirit. These sins of the spirit are colorless, shapeless, no form, no size, nothing. Invisible. If somebody thieves, you can see it with your eyes. If somebody commits some other sin, you can see them with you. If somebody is fighting, you can see with your eyes. But the sins of the flesh, which are visible with our eyes, the sins of the spirit are not visible. They are invisible. They are colorless. They are formless without any shape, without any size. 1 Corinthians in chapter 7. One I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians in chapter 7. I'm very sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises dearly beloved, the promise of the coming of the Lord, 
and the promise of resurrection from the Lord. Have holding these promises. Let us then pursue purity more than pleasures. How? By cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Daniel preferred a character more than a career because he was strengthened by the love for the giver more than a love for the gift. Joseph was strengthened by the fear of God. Therefore, he preferred purity more than pleasures. He was cleansed by all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. What does Jacob say about himself. Please come with me and open this word to the book of Genesis and chapter 40, chapter 42 and verse 18. Genesis chapter 42 and verse 18. Joseph said unto them the third day, this do and live for I fear God. Joseph was a God-fearing man. Daniel had love in his heart for the Lord. Therefore, he was strengthened. Strengthened by the love of God. We can prefer a character more than a career by loving the giver more than the gift. And secondly, strengthened by the fear of God, we can cleanse ourselves to be pure in perfect in holiness in the fear of God by preferring a purity more than pleasures. I want to read for you two things, the works of the flesh and the works and the sins of the spirit. The book of Galatians and chapter 5. The book of Galatians Chapter 5 and verse 19 and 20 and 21. Now the works of the flesh or the sins of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Turn with me to 1 Peter and chapter 2. Book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 1. These are the sins of the spirit. As I told you, invisible, colorless, without shape, without size, without any form. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, guy, hypocrisies, envies, and evil speaks. Cleanse you for God's sake because we have received the promise from God who can never tell a lie of the first resurrection. If the first resurrection is a promise given to us. Let us purify ourselves. The book of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. Follow peace with all men. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Whoever you are, you may be shouting out your preachings like me. Preachers and teachers and all such senior believers and God's servants and elders, they will have no special quota. This is the truth the Lord is speaking to me today. Pursue peace with all men. Why have I lost my peace with my brother? It's because of malice, because of envy, because of jealousy, because of evil speaking behind his back. Be careful, beloved. Be careful. Cleanse your hearts of both the sins of the flesh and the sins of the spirit. Thereby perfecting holiness, not imperfectly. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So that when we pursue this purity more than pleasures, we will certainly see our Lord when he comes and we are going to be with him. I'm burdened to close in this place and leave this message that the Lord by his Holy Spirit may inspire us to ponder upon it. The principle to be ready for the Lord's coming. Genesis 48 and verse 2. Behold, Joseph cometh. Israel strengthened himself and waited. Behold, I come quickly. So said the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. What should I say? Sorry, verse 20. Surely I come quickly. Strengthened by love of God. Strengthened by the fear of God. 
strengthened by the love of god i can prefer like daniel a character more than my career because i love the giver more than the gift strengthened by the fear of god i can cleanse myself of all the filthiness and the uncleanness of the flesh and spirit so strengthened by the love of god and the fear of god preferring a character more than a career preferring purity more than pleasure i will be able to say amen even so come lord jesus god willing god willing if he gives us a gracious time once again we will continue this sometime later and look at the other two characters also i'm very thankful to the lord for speaking to me i'm very thankful to the lord for the privilege and the honor he has given to me that i could share the burden of my heart with all my dear brothers and sisters in bethel singapore god be with you be assured i pray for each one of you when i say these are the three four names which come very quite often in my prayer list brother paul and brother john brother emmanuel and uh, brother my as a bal reddy and all these people but along with these four five names all others are also included i covet your prayers for me and my family and for the work which the lord has given to me that i also along with you i also may be prepared we all to meet with the lord in the middle praise the lord i hand it over Thank back you. to brother john praise the lord brother thank you